Reeves, it's really good to have you with us. It's nice to have somebody from Yorkshire sharing yeah. with us today. So, uh, but you're a real Yorkshire lady, aren't you? I'm absolutely a Yorkshire lady, yes. Born and bred in Sheffield? Absolutely. In the east end of Sheffield, as we say, in one of the poorest areas I was born. Right. So tell us a bit about your home. What was it like? Um, it was a very poor area. It was all terraced housing, no bathrooms, no toilets inside. You know, it's outside toilets. Um, but the community spirit was exceptional. Uh, all the men were labourers in the steelworks. Um, mm. Mums all cleaned to make a bit more money. Uh, and children played safely on the streets and in the backyards together. Uh, and I can look back with great um, joy, really, that the uh, my childhood led me to see the great benefit and beauty and wonder of living in community. Yeah, absolutely. So your, your father worked in the steelworks, did he? He did indeed. Yes, he yeah. did indeed. Yeah. And, and I often ask this, but it's interesting. Did you go to church as a family? No. Uh, Mum and dad were atheists, but... Um, working men in those days on a Sunday had a little routine that they never, you know, they never missed. The first thing they did was get up a little bit later, read the newspaper and then went to the working men's club. They came back and had a late lunch. Now, they were supposed to have a, a kind of rest. Uh, they couldn't have a rest because every one of them had seven, eight, nine children. <laughs> so the Methodist church very wisely said, let's put on a Sunday school on that hour that the men go to sleep, right, or have a rest. So and, and the uh, parents were really glad to get rid of us, as you can imagine. <laughs> oh, but the, again, the Sunday school was, uh, again, pr provided me with lovely memories. Uh, again, cared for us as children, as well as spiritually cared for us. Uh, it was a very good Sunday school. Uh, I can look back and think of uh, some of the things they did and taught us. And then after, when we got home, the men had had the rest and we all went off. You could see all families walking down the streets together to what we call the recreation ground. It was a wreck. But we went there <laughs> and we had a walk and we played on the swings. Uh, it was a lovely, a lovely family atmosphere and a lovely mm. community atmosphere. And how old were you when you left school? I left school at 15 with no exams at all. 15 in three weeks I was. <laughs> as soon as you could. And what did you do then? What job did you get? Um, well, I wanted to work with children and I was too young. So in between time, I did shorten and typing. A bit boring, you know, for me. I'm not an, an office girl at all. <laughs> um, but at 18, I, I did indeed go and uh, work, started working with children. And uh, I hadn't been there long when the matron said, would you like to do some training? And I said, yes, I would like to do some training. Mm -hmm. And for, for the first year, you had to do part time training because most of it wasn't written work. It was seeing the person and, you know, trying to figure out, is this person going to be good at the work? Mm -hmm. If they are, we'll train them. If they're not, we'll kind of see if we can do something else with them kind of style. And so I did go for a year um, part-time training to see if I was suitable for the work. Great. And, and it was at this sort of time as well, Maureen, I think, that you actually became a Christian, didn't you? I, well, I did. Become, yes, I became a Christian when I was 18, mm. uh, around this same time. Um, I had a friend uh, who was a, a Christian. Uh, I met her actually while going to the college to, learn, you know, to, to pass him some time before I was 18 to, to work. Um, and she was one of these that's really, really a strong Christian. And she said to me, um, do, do, you, do you want to become a Christian at all? I said, no, I am. I am. You know, you do. I am. <laughs> and she started um, to invite me to a Bible study. Where in that Bible study, I really learned the difference between just generally believing and suddenly homing on to this, all this person is Jesus. Uh, and the wonderful uh, thing that he offers you. Uh, I have to say, when I started taking seriously and thinking seriously about what we call the gospel, the story of Jesus, uh, I, I found it absolutely overwhelming. Mm. Uh, I can remember uh, for, for, for days and weeks pondering this wonderful story uh, and this story of God loving us. And it did capture my heart. There's, there's absolutely no way about it. It absolutely captured my heart. And um, not long after I'd met Suzanne, she said, oh, we're having one of these evangelistic preachers. You know, he'll come and preach the gospel to you. 
<laughs> and then all you have to do is say yes, please, and you say, well, you know, what, you know, you can imagine. <laughs> but seriously, uh, I did go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. I was on the very top floor of a very big hall, uh, and I thought, yeah. I absolutely want to give my life to this Jesus, to this God. Uh, and when I did it, I absolutely meant it. Uh, mm. It was not a, a little timid thing I did. Uh, it wasn't a half-hearted thing I did. I knew exactly what I was doing. Uh, I really wanted to give my, my whole being to, to Jesus and God and live my life for him. Uh, and so like everybody who gets to that moment, you know, I offered God my life and I thanked him. For offering his life to me and for what Jesus had done and I've mm. never looked back mm. and also I think um Maureen it was around about this time that you were to meet your future husband Alan I did meet my future now I met Alan in that uh, year of training um uh I was in the in the, in the lecture room facing the door facing the lecturer and the door was on the left hand side and in walked Alan uh, Alan had started a few weeks after us because he was doing finishing up another course and he walked into the room the lecturer dropped her notes he bent and picked them up for her and obviously offered them to her and kind of turned around and I looked at him and I thought that's the man I would like to marry <laughs> now to seal it Roger I had to find out if he was a Christian because seriously I would not have married a non-Christian mm. such was my commitment to God Mm. And in our training, only two or three weeks later, we had to go and do a practical. We had to go and look at a children's home, a residential home, different residential homes. Uh, and on the journey there, we sat apart. But on the journey back, um, he sat next to me. And as we kind of travelling, I suddenly thought, oh, I said, Alan, I said, that's my church. I go to church. I'm a Christian. He said, so am I. And I knew then, Roger, that I was going <laughs> to marry him. I knew it would happen. Did he so, have a choice in this himself? <laughs> <laughs> so on the 28th of October, we had our first date and he asked me to marry him at Christmas. Oh, wonderful. How many years yeah. were you married? We were married 40 years. Wonderful. And uh, Yeah, 40 years. We, we kind of uh, had to, 18 months together before we got married and then married for 40 years. And, and children? Four children, yeah. yeah. Emma's yeah. the eldest and she works for South Yorkshire Police as a dispatcher. And okay. she works with major incidents. Mm. Then comes Martin, who has a rare syndrome called the Prada Willis syndrome, and he lives he lives in a residential home. Mm. Then comes Peter, who still lives with me. And then the youngest is Alison, who's a missionary uh, with YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission, in Mozambique, right in the centre of Mozambique on the Zambezi River. Amazing. Amazing. Now... Um, Maureen, I'm sorry to sort of focus in on Christmas Day, or Christmas Eve rather, some years ago, but um, clearly life was going to suddenly dramatically change for you. Which year was it? Say that again. Wh which year was it? Uh, 12, 2012. 2012. And, and, yeah. Do you mind just talking us through what happened? Yes. Uh, what had happened, actually, at that Christmas time, I had a wonderful beginning because we hadn't seen Alison and her friend and the children they care for um, for two years. Mm. And they came home three days before Christmas Eve. Mm. So we did the usual things. You know, we had presents together, caught up with them, you know, just rejoiced at being able to see them. It was just a wonderful three days. We're not shoppers very much. Uh, we do most of our shopping, but we had walks together, you know, met uh, family. They met, um, you know, brothers and sisters and, and uh, aunties and uncles. And it got round to the Christmas Eve evening. Mm. And again, it was just a lovely evening. You know, we had some music on. Uh, we were reminiscing about something. And um, I remember us talking about the future a little bit, what they were hoping for when they went back. And um, what was happening here in High Green in Sheffield. It just was a lovely evening. Now, in all the years that Alan and I had been married, Alan played the organ or piano for the midnight service. Mm. He was a very gifted musician and he was also a singer. Sometimes he would sing at weddings, for example. Mm. And uh, for probably since Emma was born, the eldest, I hadn't gone and joined him, obviously, because of looking after the children. Um, so usually around uh, 10 to 11, 11 o'clock, it was getting ready for the midnight service. And on this particular Christmas Eve, um, uh, he put his coat on 
And he said to me, oh, goodness me, he said, uh, I'll hurry back tonight. He said, I bet it's cold out there. You know, I said, hurry up, lovey, and, and this kind of thing. And off he went. Only a few minutes later, he was back. He said, I've come back for my hat. He said, it's bitter out there. He said, it'll be really cold in our church. Now, you could reflect on that, Roger, and say that how strange life is, because if Alan hadn't have come back, Mm. I think the incident wouldn't have happened to him. Mm. But I don't see life like that, but it's just a reflection. So uh, I actually, my parting words to him were, love you lots, hurry up now, don't be late. <laughs> Never knowing, of course, that those would be my last, last words to him. Mm. Now, I always get ready for bed. I don't wait up for Alan, but I always get ready for bed and go to bed and hopefully wait up for him so I can say, you know, Christmas Day to him. And as I was in bed, I was reading, and suddenly I heard the, uh, an ambulance go past our house. And also, police, I could see the flashing lights, and I could tell the difference between a big ambulance and a small kind of police car. Mm. And I thought, oh, no. Uh, obviously, for a family here in High Green, something dreadful is happening. You know, perhaps it's a heart attack or something. And I remember praying for that family, that mm. that ambulance and police car were going to little knowing that actually they were going for Alan because Alan had been attacked on the street where we live and they were passing my house to get to Alan who was further up the street who had been attacked by two young men. Right. Now, how did you hear the news of his attack? Um, uh, what had happened was that um, these two young men had been walking round high green quite happily apparently uh, as the cameras had showed them uh, they were not drunk and they were not on drugs mm. but something happened to them and the police tell us that they've never got to the bottom of it but after they've come out of the pub at around whatever it was quarter to 11 i'm not sure of timing they walked past the methodist church that has a hut and they decided to break into this hut and we still don't know why. But they picked up two pickaxes and they knocked off with a stone or a brick the ends of the pickaxes. And, you know, so, so all they got with the handles mm. and carried these heavy handles around with them. Um, why? Did they never told the police? Mm. Um, but as I say, they went on drugs and they went drunk. And they started walking around High Green. And eventually they tried with cameras to the end of our street and there's, there's some cameras that are tracking them walking on Christmas Eve with Alan in front of them and then the cameras actually see them picking up pace by now they're walking really quickly towards him and they're running towards him but the cameras actually do miss the actual incident but they then um, ran up behind him and started attacking him with the you know the, the pickaxe handles uh, it was an extremely brutal attack. Mm. Uh, it was a very full attack and it was on his head. Mm. And uh, when they had finished, they, they left him on the street and they went back home to uh, the two men, by the way, were called Ashley Foster and Jonathan Bowling. And they went back to Jonathan's house and left Alan on the street. Mm. Uh, and by this time, uh, it was having a kind of epileptic fit. It, apparently it was because his, his, his brain was in, uh, real trauma uh, and a passerby obviously was seeing him on the ground and rang up the police and ambulance service and and they then came and told you Maureen yeah uh, the, uh, yeah the, the police the, the police Both told the me door. all of this yeah, yeah. the police Before told me the story you're dressing gown you open the door and there were two policemen or whatever yeah, yeah. Wow. now obviously um I was in the house still while all this was happening outside uh, and the police came to my door uh, and, and said, are you Mrs. Greaves? And I said, yes. And they said, um, your husband's had a very bad accident to his head. Now, at this stage, I just picked up the word accident and thought, oh. And I said to the police, OK, I'll get dressed. Where is he? Mm -hmm. I do remember them saying, please let us take you. And I said, no, I'll take my own car and then I can bring Alan back and it will release you because, it's, you know, after all, it's Christmas Day. You'll get, you know, you better get back home. Obviously, just picking up the word accident that made me think it just got a bit of, you know, a sore head or something. Um, I got to the hospital. Uh, I, I felt quite all right. I remember arriving at the hospital and being asked to wait in the waiting room. 
Uh, and I actually went into the corridor and I can remember leaning against the wall of the corridor, singing Silent Night to myself, mm. quite at peace, quite mm. OK. Just thinking, oh, tomorrow, if, if Alan's OK, and we get him home. At least he might be able to sit in the room, you know, and, and still enjoy the company. Uh, I saw uh, uh, what I now know as a consultant and a nurse walking towards me. And so I actually did go back in the waiting room. Uh, but when they came into the waiting room, I knew something dreadful had happened. I could tell by the, the, the face straight away and the demeanour. Uh, the consultant sat down and he said to me, uh, I'm ever so sorry to tell you that your husband has been attacked very heavily, very brutally on his head. And then he went silent. And I said to him, is he dying? And he said, I'm afraid so. Uh, so I said, can I, can I go and see him? And he said, yes. Uh, as I stood up, uh, obviously you can't take something like that in immediately, but as mm -hmm. I stood up, uh, I remember praying and I said, please, please, Father. Uh, I've suddenly started on a very, very painful, unexpected journey. P please take me through it and let it be somehow for your glory. Mm -hmm. And I, I was praying that as I was leaving the room and going down the corridor to Alan's room. Now, when I got into Alan's room, I could see he was going to die. His whole head was absolutely, uh, by this stage, blown up. There were cuts and gashes all over it. There were kind of pads all over him, you know, bandages, little pads and all sorts. Um, it had been put in a coma to help him to, to rest because his, his, his um, brain was still firing, as they call it to help, help his body to rest and, and so on. But I just knew he was going to, to die. Um, I asked the consultant if he would phone the two daughters so that they could mm. come in. And while this was happening, um, I left Alan and I went into uh, the entrance where the lifts were. Uh, by this time, I was, I was you know, really, really sobbing and really heartbroken mm. to suddenly realise what was happening. But I also was conscious that the girls would be arriving any moment. Now, can I just say, at this stage, I couldn't, I couldn't bring the, the two, my two sons, our two okay. sons in, uh, because uh, Martin has special needs, and, and so does Peter to some degree. I knew that I couldn't cope with, with them and, and what would be their needs at this very um, awful moment. So the girls were just coming in by, this, by themselves at this stage. Um, and as they came through the through the um, elevator, um, and I walked, started to walk towards them, they just burst out crying because they knew they didn't know till that point uh, how bad the dad was. He just asked the girls to come in. Mm. Uh, to be honest, I didn't think there was any other way of telling them uh, what would happen to the dad. But like the consultant had told me, so I just said, you know, that these uh, two two men had attacked the you know the dad on his head. And that he was so very wounded um, and his brain so damaged at this stage that he, he wouldn't live. Uh, and we hung around a little bit until we were able to go back in the room. Uh, and I have to say the three of us were, were quite distraught by this stage because all three of us realised um, that we were losing somebody very precious to us. Mm. Uh, I can say that we had an ordinary marriage, by the way, Roger. Uh, it, it did have its rows. It did have its moments. Mm. It did have his, he would sometimes say to me, I don't like you very much today, Maureen. And I've said to him, I don't like you either. <laughs> you know what marriage can be like, you know, those days. But we were spiritual partners from the minute that we married. In fact, mm. before we married, we prayed together. Uh, Alan led, uh, preached, I led services sometimes. Um, he was a senior social worker, mm. um, but he would also love to do a bit of evangelism with, with me. Uh, mm. We were spiritual partners. And mm. therefore, uh, uh, as you may know, it, 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 there's a bond, a real bond that comes between you when mm. you're, you know, you're not just physical partners and friends. Mm. So I was losing someday really very precious. Mm. Uh, it would be nothing uh, easy for me to say um, that he was definitely my soulmate. So mm. the loss of him was, was extremely difficult for me to take. Mm. Uh, and then suddenly it gets to morning and... Christmas Day is unfolding a little bit more. And of course, this was hitting our news headlines. Uh, you know, we, we were all celebrating Christmas, hearing about this organist who was murdered on the way to going to play in the midnight service. Yeah. And, um, 
the, the media were very interested in all of this, weren't they? They picked it up very, very quickly, I'm told, by the police. Yes. Within it, within the, the um, communications going on between the um, uh, police and ambulances and dispatchers, uh, the news was picked up. Mm. Whether it's because it was Christmas Eve, I don't know. Uh, that's what the officers think. It was a Christmas well, it was Eve story. Poignant, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And there was also a sense right from the beginning that this, this was a man that was innocent. Uh, it wasn't part of any any syndicate. It wasn't part of any any um, gangs. It was an elderly man in that mm. sense who innocently was walking along the road and had been brutally attacked for what appeared to be no reason. Mm. Uh, so there the story are. was hitting the headlines. Mm. You must have now. Had... I didn't know that at this stage, of course. No. Uh, I had no idea what was happening out there. My, my whole world was focused on Alan. Mm. Um, but it got round to six o'clock on Christmas Day morning. And by this time, Alan had, you know, had been seen to, um, the doctors had left the room. There was only a nurse left. And uh, I was aware that uh, we needed to make some telephone calls. Mm. So the girls went off to get a cup of tea and to make some telephone calls to my brothers and sisters to tell them what had happened to Alan, because some of them we would have met on Christmas Day, and uh, to try and find a way, if they could, of talking to the staff at Martin's home and, and, and just saying, we'll phone Martin later. Don't say anything to him, but we'll phone him later. Uh, and, and really, for the first time, I found myself sitting with Alan by myself. Mm. At this stage, the nurse had just popped out, and I was totally alone with Alan. And I took his hand... And I remember that that very morning I was going to lead the service on Christmas Day and Alan was going to preach. And one of the things that you do in a Church of England service is you always say the Lord's Prayer. Now, I have no idea who had done this to Alan. I didn't know if it was a gang, a single person, a couple. I did get the um, a little bit of a, a little bit of story from the police that the it wasn't an accident. It wasn't it had been run over. It, it had been deliberate. Mm. So as I was holding Alan's hand uh, and thinking about the fact that he'd been deliberately hurt, well more than hurt, obviously, mm. my mind turned to those who had done it, and I did ponder for just a very short while. Who could have done this on, on Christmas Eve night? Mm. Who would have done it? But as I was pondering it, the, 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 it came to me, today I would have done the Lord's Prayer. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, of course, you've got that really, uh, I don't know really to call it one line or two line. Forgive, mm. forgive, forgive. Mm. And if you don't forgive, well, what happens? So we get to the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Uh, go on, I can't start it off. Our Father in heaven. Yes, uh, well, forgive us yeah, our sins. And so on. Our Father in heaven. Mm. Uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have mm. sinned against us. Mm. Now, as a Christian, it is one of the most marvelous things that you experience. Right from the beginning of your Christian walk, it starts with forgiveness. Mm. Because you ask, you ask Jesus and God, please forgive me for the life I've lived. You know, I want to be your child. And all the way through your Christian life, you are asking again and again and again, please forgive me. Mm. These things, little things. And don't you know, and don't we know as Christians, that it is absolutely real that we are forgiven. And not only forgiven, but set free. Not always from consequences, but definitely set free from the condemnation. And I think it's one of the most marvellous things of the Christian story, that we can know this forgiveness. And so as I pondered this, these two lines, you know, Father, forgive us as we forgive those who, are, you know, we need to be forgiven. And um, I thought, there's just no way I can't forgive these people. Then I thought of Alan, who would be preaching on Christmas Day. Again, this wonderful story of the baby coming. And what did he come for? But to give us forgiveness, mm. to set us free and to give us eternity through his forgiveness. And Alan would have preached that the saviour of the world has come and turned to him. Mm. And so as I held Alan's hand, I said, Heavenly Father, please will you give me your grace and your power 
to truly forgive and fully forgive whoever has done this to Alan. Mm. Enable me to forgive them for always. So it's not constantly popping back into my head. Mm. And will you please help me also in the, uh, to give me ability to place them in your hands so that I can leave them there. That I don't suddenly find myself thinking about them all the time, going to bed with them all the time. That I can leave them in your hands because you will deal with them with your justice and your mercy and your grace. Mm. And just then, Alison and Emma walked into the room. Uh, and a few minutes later, I told them what I did done. And they both, you know, we just kind of had a hug and another mm. cry. Mm. Uh, and in the, then the rest of the Christmas day was spent with the family coming to say goodbye to Alan. Mm. Maureen, it's all very moving and um, and time is going, but I'd like to, because eventually they did identify these two guys. And as you say, still to this day, there's no rhyme or reason behind what they did, but they did eventually go to trial. And and that can be very traumatic, can't it, for the family who, who are oh. left? But, yeah. So, can I just say, yeah. Yes. Can I just say that a murder isn't like an ordinary death? It isn't the grief that's different. We all grieve the same when we lose somebody. Yes. But when it's a murder, immediately, immediately the police are at your door. And for days and weeks afterwards, they come in constantly to ask you questions, to try and find out how it's happened, why it's happened. Had Alan done anything to bring it on himself? These questions, by the way, didn't disturb me because I, I knew I was mature enough to know there were questions that needed to be asked. Yeah. But you don't have that space um, to grieve properly. You don't have that grief to that space to take things in really what's happening. Yeah. And then all of a sudden came the day when we get the telephone call to say that they'd arrested two young men, uh, Jonathan Bolin and Ashley Foster. Uh, and when I got the telephone call, my first reaction was, are you sure it's them? And they said, we're absolutely sure, mm. absolutely sure. And what had happened was another little miracle because um, they couldn't find any clues. There, there weren't any clues for them to, to, to ascertain who could have done this. Uh, what happened was they found a very, very dark film on a camera on our street, Greengate Lane, where we live, tracking Alan. And they managed to see two figures behind, but they couldn't make out the figures at all. And one young police officer said, I'm going to take that to London. I'm, I'm going to find somebody that can do something because we think this is our only clue. Mm. And he took it somewhere and they did a fantastic work on it. And they managed to get two grainy figures of these two young men, Ashley and Jonathan, walking down the street together. And it went right across the television. Uh, on, on all television kind of lines it was there and I don't know if you remember it Roger uh, these two men walking down and suddenly somebody said that's you Ashley and that's Jonathan oh wow yeah. and Ashley went to the police station and said I know who's killed Alan it's Jonathan Bowling but I have nothing to do with it huh. now the police obviously picked them both up and decided that both of them did have something to do with it. Mm. Jonathan Bowling pleaded guilty after a few weeks because they found the pickaxe handle that he'd used. Oh. And when it hit Alan, it hit him with such force that the momentum sent him over Alan's head and his hand landed on the ground. And he scratched it on the ground as he landed and the blood from his hand went onto the pickaxe handle. So they managed to get the DNA. But Ashley Foster went to trial. Again, it's horrendous. It really is. Um, you're listening to things, you are watching things, you're seeing things on the screen, you know, like all his head. Uh, you're listening to, to two barristers fighting for their cause, of course, mm -hmm. which is right. It, it is absolutely how it is. You've got Ashley's family living, sitting just to the left of you and just behind you. you, you you're very, very much together. Uh, this is explained to us because they take mm -hmm. you into court before it. But still, the reality is that's how it is. Mm. And it really was extremely harrowing. But again, there was a, a, a little um, episode that uh, I believe God was in. Um, when we went to the magistrate's court just to hear, 
uh, these two men sentenced to go to court, to Crown Court, to be tried. Uh, I bumped into Ashley's and Jonathan's mums on the way out of the court. Uh, and I just couldn't do anything else but just kind of go up and give them a love and, and, and say to them that I did want justice for Alan, but I also understood that they wanted justice for their sons. Mm. And I was praying for us all, because all of us, including their families, were going to end up at court and it was going to be harrowing for all of us. So on the, the, during the trial, we were patting each other on the staircase, obviously, as we were going up and down to court or going to the toilets or going for food. Uh, and we were well able, um, uh, myself and the two parents, to say good morning to each other. We didn't get over pally, but we were able to say good morning to each other. Mm. And in a sense, put a kind of, um, you know, God brought a sense of holiness into that into that uh, court and into the area in front of court and afterwards the police did say you know usually the family that's the injured party and the the, the family of the perpetrators uh, are just miles away from each other this great anger distress upset showing in lots of ways but we have never experienced such sense of peace mm. uh, in the corridor and in the courtroom Mm. Um, because we'd prayed for it, Roger. Mm. You know, we had prayed that God would be present and that somehow the whole way it was conducted would bring people to an understanding that God was present. Mm. Now, they were found guilty, but not quite in the way you'd expect. No. Obviously, it came to the end of the trial. And uh, can, I, I, can I just say that for me, the evidence did point to actually being... Uh, working alongside of, of Jonathan and hitting Alan's head. Mm. Um, but of course, you've got to wait for the verdict. And you know, when when the when it lights up for you to go back in court, uh, it really is a very, very shocking moment. Mm. Uh, you, you feel almost sick in your stomach. Now, I'd really prayed about this because I knew if the ending went against us in the sense that Ashley was set free, it was something I would have to cope with. And I think all of us would have coped with it. It would have, it would have been hard for us, mm. very hard for us for, to see him go free. Uh, now, I said to my family, if we lose the case, please be respectful. Because the other family, you know, mm. if we win the case, still be respectful. Mm. Uh, just let's kind of stay calm and be respectful. So we went upstairs and got into court. And uh, the clerk of the court said, Cha uh, Chairman of the jury, do you find Ashley Foster guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Up swept Ashley's family, literally to just to the left of us, mm. uh, really rejoicing, really, he had a girlfriend, uh, and it's, you know, really rejoicing. Uh, and we just sat there. Uh, at this stage, um, I looked over at Mr. Fennick, who was leading the investigation, and he looked over at me. Uh, we didn't do anything, you know, we, did, we obviously, did, uh, you know, I, I just looked at him. Yeah. And I remember thinking, OK, God, it's not what I wanted and it's not what I expected. That, that was in my thoughts, you know, as I was talking to God about it. And I was holding a cross in my hand that I'd received in the hospital uh, on the, uh, uh, as I went to, to, to church uh, in the chapel in the hospital on Christmas Day. Um, and, and, and I saw the judge writing. I saw the two barristers typing out the verdict. And, and we were just sitting quiet as a family. They were starting to move from the chairs when all of a sudden the foreman said, excuse me, you haven't asked us. We find him guilty of manslaughter. Uh. Now, I have to say, you know, Ashley's family then, you know, you, you can't help but have, have some pity on, on the situation mm. because for them then it was absolutely horrendous. They were obviously starting to say, oh, no, and, and crying mm. and were very, very distressed. And we could understand that because of what they'd heard, that mm. he was free. Um, eventually, we, we, we left the court and um, you are given the option, if you want, to speak outside of court. Now. I decided to set to do a statement outside of court and I decided to write it with Alison and Emma um, of what we were going to say. Mm. Uh, and I decided I didn't want it to be long 
and so it was it, it was it's more it more or less this i can't i can't remember it word for word mm. but we thanked the police for the work they'd done mm. uh, it was all christmas time new year and they had no time off and they had worked tremendously for alan and extra because there were no clues to lead them anywhere mm. uh i then said um that it was my prayer that ashley and jonathan would come to know true repentance of what they had done mm. but also true repentance in the fact that they ask god also for forgiveness that they would then know the presence of god with them as they journeyed on in, in wherever they, whichever prison they were going to go to and that they were made in the image of god and therefore they were loved by god mm. and then i just finished it by saying you know thank you for everyone was done what they can to make the journey for us less arduous and to ease our suffering mm. um and i did mean what i said because of course ashley and jonathan are made in the image of god mm, and in god's eyes we're no different to alan or i he loved them just as much as he loved alan mm. and myself ashley has served his time and he's out now isn't he yeah he's out of prison now no, well ashley's out of prison yes, yes. Uh, he got nine years uh it's still tight because he's got to do his full nine years yeah. uh, jonathan ha got 25 years minimum mm. he can't ask for parole until 25 years is up mm. uh they took it that jonathan had led it mm. and that ashley had followed him um now can i just say that a lot of people talk to me about ashley's sentence thinking it was very very low in one sense you could say it was low but it didn't worry me because all of us, including myself and Alan, uh, we're all responsible to God for the things that we do. And as Christians, we know that we can go to him, as I've already said, and truly repent and be forgiven mm. and continue to live, a, hopefully, a, a better life and not do that thing again. But I also believe that whatever sentence Ashley had got, or Jonathan, uh, it was in the limelight. Uh, people would remember him when he came out. He'd been on the, in the newspapers and on the media uh, for a long, long time. And therefore, I do believe that I placed him in God's hands and I could leave him there, whether the sentence was not long enough or was okay. It didn't matter to me at that stage. I placed him in God's hands and I was happy to leave him in God's hands and to let God take, you know, just go, go on, on a journey with uh, Ashley and Jonathan. Mm. Uh, so I was okay about it. Two quick questions because time's gone, but Maureen, are you bitter? Say it again. Are you bitter? Oh, not at all. No, not at all. I was never bitter. Um, there was no reason for me to be bitter. Uh, where is Alan after all? Is in heaven. Uh, we absolutely know that because it's a promise of God. But those who believe in him, he was going to make a room for them. I remember thinking a few weeks after Alan had died, I wonder if they'd put a piano in there because Alan loved his piano <laughs> in that room for him in heaven. I wasn't bitter. No. I didn't need to be, better, be bitter because they were in God's hands. Mm. Uh, so was I. Mm. So was I. And I knew I was going to be well looked after by God. Well, you've answered my second question, and that is, will you see Alan? I know you believe you're going to see the Lord because in the end, heaven Indeed. is all about Jesus. But do you believe you'll see Alan one day? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're uh, just, not because he was good or you're no, good. No, what Jesus just because it, it, well, there's this great promise, isn't there? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Mm. And just occasionally, because uh, Alan and I are great singers, you know, uh, Alan used to play the piano and I'd sing along some new choruses he was learning. Just now and again, I can just imagine Alan standing next to me when I'm having a good sing with a tape, you know, I put on or a CD uh, and thinking, yeah, one day it really will be real. I'll be singing with Alan again in heaven. We were going to ask you to sing again, but time's gone. <laughs> it, has, it has indeed. It has indeed. Um, Maureen, thank you very, very much. Do you still cry? I do. Occasionally I do. Yeah. Mm. I really loved him. It really was a, a love relationship. Mm. Uh, and again, I'm not really taking to singleness easily. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not unhappy in that sense. Um, but I enjoy being married and singleness has been a bit of a challenge, but even so, I get through it very well. 
God bless you. Thank you very, very much, Maureen. It's good to That's have okay. had you with us. Yes, yeah. thank God you. God bless you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. Oh, is that good? That was recorded. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, that was very moving to hear uh, your story. And I'm sure we've all been challenged by that. And thank you for joining with us tonight and giving us that opportunity to ask questions as well. So do be thinking uh, about those as well. But let me um, uh, welcome Martin. Martin's down on the East Coast somewhere. There he is. And it's good to have Martin with us. He's going to speak to us for a few minutes now. So let me hand over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks very much, Maureen as well. Here's um, I've got a PowerPoint thing that's going to go alongside the the um, the talk tonight. So hopefully you'll be able to see that as well. But it was just amazing to hear Maureen talk so powerfully about forgiveness and how she had forgiven those who had done such evil to her family and to Alan in, in particular. And so I wanted to really pick up tonight on that theme of forgiveness. And Kez earlier read out for us one of the ancient songs in the Bible, a psalm, Psalm 130. And in Psalm 130, I just want to pick out a couple of lines and let that kind of really lead our thinking tonight over the next 10 or so minutes about forgiveness. This is what the psalmist wrote. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Now, living in the 21st century, it seems to me as though we've got a, a kind of 20, 21st century version of that psalm that we've tweaked it, twisted it around a bit. And instead of saying, if you owe Lord, it seems that we replace that now with, if you owe Internet, kept a record of sins, who could stand? With you, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, everyone is feared. And, and, and that seems very much the, the way we live our lives at the moment, so much online and it's so much in our lives that there seems to be this real tangible sense that we have a, a fear about whether people online will forgive us um, if we ever mess up and make a mistake, if we say the wrong thing at the wrong time in, in the wrong way. We know that people have come down on us like a ton of bricks. The Internet will come down on us like a ton of bricks unless we tip our heads, uh, tip our hat, sorry, to, to the latest um, cause that everyone says we should be tipping our hats to, then we fear the reaction of, of the internet. We fear that the hounds will be set upon us, the releasing of the hounds will happen and we will be brought down. Because as we look out in, in the world in which we live and as we listen to all the stuff that goes on in the news and in social media, there seems to be no forgiveness that is that is offered in the world in which we live and yet all there does seem to be instead is lots of ranting and lots of raging and what the world needs most is forgiveness and yet with the internet there doesn't seem to be any so what's the response of people well you'll see this time and time again the time is to do uh, the, 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 the response is to self-flagellate is to beat yourself up um, and publicly do so and grovel and climb up those stairs and 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 it's just you have to beat yourself up for what you've done wrong and not only that you need to educate yourself and there's so many people who now who say i commit myself i will educate myself on this matter and not only will we have to educate because there's no forgiveness then also we'll have to really capitulate and give in and give up and just say i must do better i will do better and it seems as though there is just no forgiveness around. One of the, uh, the big books out there, or the go-to books at least, on the whole subject of forgiveness is a book written by a guy called Simon Wiesenthal, who was a survivor of the concentration camps, a Jewish guy. And he wrote this book on forgiveness called The Sunflower. And uh, to plot spoil the book for you, he, he really throws up this point as, as, as a central issue. And it is this, that who you sin against, you need to receive forgiveness from. Who you sin against, you must have forgiveness from. And, and, and that is a big problem in the world in which you currently live, currently live. Because if we sin so publicly and the internet hears about it and the internet keeps a record of all our wrongs, then, then and the internet cannot forgive us and won't forgive us, 
then then there can be no forgiveness in our lives. And who can stand if at any moment everyone can see the mistakes we've made and not just the mistakes, the things we've intentionally done wrong as well. No one can stand. Sooner or later, all of us will fall. And so in that perspective, then, in the world in which we live, there, we fear everyone. We fear making a little misstep here or a major mistake over there. So the 20, 21st century version of that psalm, the one that a lot of people seem to be living by today, is this. If you, O oh Internet, kept a record of sins, who could stand? With you, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, everyone is feared. That's why it was so refreshing tonight to hear Maureen speaking about genuine, real forgiveness. That in a world where there's just a lack of it and where we've been bombarded by these waves time and time again of anger and, and just retribution. It was so great to hear tonight of Maureen talking about the light that Jesus has brought into her life and that she is then able to offer to others in terms of forgiveness and and she gets that because she gets that from what we're told to be the reality in life from the bible about real forgiveness and that's why i want to come back to what the psalm actually says and just for us to think about that in these remaining minutes it says there again psalm 130 if you O lord kept a record of sins O lord who could stand but with you there is forgiveness therefore you are feared so let's think about that for a moment. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, we know the Bible says that God does know everything we've ever done, every thought we've had, every action we've undertaken, every word we've spoken. And, and so there is this record of sins. But sins in the Bible, a sin is when you miss the mark. And missing the mark is failing to love God and to love people. And so as human beings, all of us have therefore failed to be truly human we've all missed the target sure there are times in our lives where we've we've loved well and we've been kind and we've been generous and we've hit the target but for so many um, times in our lives we've just missed the target by mile. we've not loved god we've not loved others as we should and often we're not even aiming at the target we're just aiming at another target which is just to love ourselves and so all of us have sinned and and yet the bible says that when the reason why we wrong one another is because ultimately each time we are wronging God. Maureen, Maureen spoke quite a bit there about how we all are created in the image of God. We are to reflect what God is like in this world. And so when we attack someone else, another human being, whether that's physically or verbally or, or in whatever way it may be, when we're attacking the image of God, a fellow human being, we're saying, I don't really like the substance of the reality behind that image. I don't like the God of this universe. I don't like the cut of his jib. I just don't like that God. I don't like what he's about or what this life is about in his image. And so every time we do something wrong against someone else, it is always wrong because it is ultimately and fundamentally against the God of this universe, whose image we are created in. And so when the psalmist asks that question then, well, who can stand if you, O Lord, kept a record of wrongs, which he does, a record of sins, then who could stand? The answer is none of us. We're all like a Christmas tree that's been blown over in the wind. Each one of us has fallen because each one of us has failed to love God and love others as we should. That's why the message of Christmas is such good news. That's why the message of the psalm is such good news, because it says we don't have the despair of the world in which there is no forgiveness. But actually, it says this, but with you, with you, Lord, with you, God, there is forgiveness. And that's really what Christmas is all about. That's why love came down at Christmas. The one that we had sinned against became a human being. Jesus, God, the son, became flesh, became a human being to bring us to God, to bring us to God through forgiveness. That's what Alan was going off to play those Christmas carols about eight years ago. He was playing, going to play Christmas carols all about who Jesus is and what he has done for you and for me and for every single person in this world. But with you, there is forgiveness. That is exactly what Maureen was able to talk about um, there and, and offer and give out to those who have killed Alan. 
real forgiveness because she had received Jesus, the one who'd forgiven her. She was able to allow that forgiveness to overflow out of her to, to others. How do we get this forgiveness? Well, as we know, with the, the Christmas story, Jesus was born and then he lives his life. And age 33, he gets crucified. He gets killed brutally on a cross. And as Jesus was, was dying on the cross, he was paying for all of our sins, for, of all the sins of all the people across all time. And what I love about what happens on this on this horrific moment is that Jesus isn't spouting out the platitudes or the I must try harders of our age. He wasn't saying you must do better or there's still more for you to do. Now, when Jesus was being crucified on the cross, he cried out these words. It is finished. That is, he paid for all the sins of all the people of all time were on the cross. And that was a job that was completely beautifully accomplished, finished in completion. And that is how you get forgiveness, that Jesus bore the punishment that all of us deserve so that if we receive him, we can have forgiveness. You know, that, that question that the psalmist asks, oh Lord, who could stand? And remember, we've already answered that with, well, none of us can. We haven't got a chance of standing. We've all fallen. We've all, all been blown over by our own sin. So who could stand? Well, is, it, is there any light? Yes, there is, because Jesus himself is that light he is the only person who truly can stand before god the father you know three days after jesus was died died and was buried on the third day he resurrected he rose again he came back to life and that word resurrection means literally to stand again so on the third day jesus stood again who can stand before god the only person is Jesus, which is why unless we have Jesus and unless we are united with Jesus, we won't be able to stand before God as our judge come judgment day. But if we have Jesus, if we have turned to him and trusted in him, then we are united with him. And in him, we get to stand on our feet because he forgives all of our sins and rips up that record of wrongs that were set against us. As I, as I finish, you might remember from that, those, those two verses are quoted in Psalm 130. It says, but with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Now, does that say then when you come to trust in Jesus and receive his forgiveness, does that mean then you just simply transfer your fear of the world to just being afraid of God? The answer is no, it doesn't mean that. Because when in this psalm, when it says, therefore, you are feared, what it means is something very different. You see, if we didn't have forgiveness in Jesus, then we would just face God as our judge. And of course, we should be petrified because we're all sinners and our record of wrong is stacked against us. But if we are forgiven in Jesus, then what does that mean? That means we are welcomed in. We are welcomed home with those welcoming arms that Jesus outstretched on the cross for you and for me. When it says, therefore, you are feared, it means that because we've received forgiveness and because when someone trusts in Jesus, they now stand in Jesus, united with him. That means now that there's this, this deep rooted joy, this overwhelming, whoa, this is what the fear means. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely gobsmacked that God would love me like this, that he would give up his own son to die for me, despite what I've done in my life. I am absolutely trembling in and it would in amazing awe at this. If you remember Tango adverts, the orange fizzy drink can adverts from about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, probably, um, where you, people got tangoed in the face and they end up with a shocked face. That's what the psalmist is on about. When you receive forgiveness, you are so shocked, so amazed, so in awe of the God of this universe who loves you so much. He gave you Jesus. That's what the psalmist is telling us. That fear means. And, and as I wrap up, if you end up reading the rest of the psalm, and I, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. You see that this is exactly what this word fear means, because as soon as the psalmist goes, ah, oh, but with you, there is forgiveness. Oh, I don't have to despair anymore. Now I fear you. What does he say? He says this. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord like a night watchman waiting for the coming of the dawn. He's longing now to be with Jesus and to know him fully because he's received forgiveness. That's what fear 
of God really means. And it ends, the psalm ends with this, for with the Lord, there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. And so he's convinced that because of Jesus, because of what Jesus would do for him and what he has done for, for us, that there is this unfailing love. There is this forever forgiveness in Jesus. There is this reality that in Jesus, you will always be able to stand before the Father and enjoy the God of this universe. And I just love, as I finish here, how it says there that his redemption, the way he buys us back, it overflows. Because we saw that, didn't we, with Maureen and, and her testimony, her story, that she has received this forgiveness from Jesus. And it's clearly exuding out of her. It's overflowed into her and out of her to those who, who she has forgiven. And in that Jesus, the same Jesus who's transformed Maureen, is the Jesus who wants to transform your life by bringing you forgiveness. And so I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And it's a prayer that if you want to receive Jesus and the forgiveness that he brings, if you want to turn from your sin and receive him and have him at the center of your life, then pray this prayer with me now. Let me pray. And you can echo these words in the quietness of your own heart or mind. Dear Father, I want to confess tonight that I know there is a record of my sins stacked up against me. But I thank you that with you there is forgiveness. And Father, tonight I pray that you would tear up that record of wrongs because Jesus paid the price for my sin when he died on the cross. And Father, I pray now that you would forgive me by giving me your son, Jesus. Father, give me new life now, I pray. And would Jesus now be the one who I now stand in and live my life in, following him and loving and forgiving others as I have been loved and forgiven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to hand back over to Dave now, but if, if you want any um, more information, Dave will tell you a bit more um, about how to find out more about Jesus. Over to you, Dave. Great. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, well, maybe if you have prayed tonight, do get in touch with us. You can go to reallives.net and you'll find a contact form on there. If you want a copy of the New Testament or a John's Gospel or a booklet on uh, just more help on becoming a Christian, then you can request those things there. So reallives.net, do go there and um, get in touch with us. We've already got a number of questions, so we're going to go straight over to Phyllis down in London and uh, you can bring us those questions. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Maureen, I hope these questions are not too um, um, insensitive but were your daughters able to have that same level of forgiveness at the beginning or did they find it hard to forgive? Uh, they understood what I had done because of my Christian faith but uh, one of my daughters isn't a Christian but she wanted to stand with me. Uh, the missionary sick daughter uh, absolutely stood with me in forgiving uh, those who had murdered her dad um, so I did feel that we were in unity straight away, um, even with the daughter that doesn't have such a strong faith as we do. Lovely. And, and with your sons, how were, you able, how were you able to explain Alan's death to them? Did they understand uh, where Alan had gone, what had happened? It was very difficult to explain to them uh, what had happened to the dad. Um, I had a lot of help from the liaison police officers to do that and one liaison officer looked after one son and another liaison officer looked after another son and they actually brought both sons into the hospital on Boxing Day um, so that, you know, obviously I could then be with them uh, and, uh, you know, take them into the room where their dad was. Um, I think it was difficult for a long time for the boys to process what had happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as a mum, it was very important for me to try and look after our four children, even though they're grown up. Mm -hmm. um, I think it took a long time for both sons to process it. Yeah, tough. Um, how do you cope with the emptiness of your home without Alan? As I've said, I did find it and I have found it very difficult to become single after such a very close partnership. 
Um, but you know, God is with you and, and life changes all the time for all of us. And so going into widowhood, I went into it with God. Mm -hmm. uh, and God is well able, you know, to, to meet your needs. He's well able to see you through circumstances. Uh, I'm a church army officer. I've stayed working full time. I absolutely love my work. It's very, very varied. Uh, and it's kept me busy. And that's mm -hmm. helpful. Um, but yes, it is true that the house is empty of Alan. Uh, and you 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 deal you have to deal with it. You you have to find a way under God to move on with your life and move on well. And I did want to move on well. I didn't mm. want to kind of get stuck in any uh, rut or grief that uh, in the end became self-absorbing. Uh, I knew that God had still got a life for me to live, still things for me to do. And so I have moved on, you know, with that and uh, very well moved on very well with God's help. Yeah. And what about Christmas? Do you find, are you able to celebrate Christmas or does it just bring back really painful memories and you find you don't really want to speak about that part, celebrate that time of year, really? It's both. It's both. Um, Ashley and Jonathan uh, are very much part of every Christmas Eve now. Yeah. Uh, so is Mr Fennick, who was the police officer doing the investigation and the liaison officers. All of them are very much part of Christmas now. Um, the day before Christmas Eve, uh, it starts to get into your mind quite, you know, in a big way. Uh, I pray for every one of them during Christmas Eve day. Um, but I am a Christian and my focus isn't on Ashley and Jonathan. My focus is on the saviour of the world coming. So I do celebrate Christmas. You know, I still put the trimmings up. Uh, I've got carol singing. I give out Roger's leaflets. Uh, you know, I'm an evangelist at heart because I'm a church army officer. I lead the, I usually lead the morning service on Christmas Day in church. Um, and it is still a wonderful season despite what has happened. Yeah, lovely. Um, and just one question, and then I'll ask Martin a question. Has Ashley moved out of the area or could there be a time when you meet him or his family? Would you find that hard? I meet his family, well, I did meet his family because they lived in High Green. Um, both the, uh, uh, Ashley and Jonathan only live a few streets away from where I live. Uh, and so I did meet his family in shops and in Asta. Uh, I always greeted them warmly and, and, and it was all right. But when someone's been in prison, uh, they're not allowed to come out and live in the same area as the victim. So yeah. it has to be, I think it's 25 miles away from you. And certainly while he's on parole, he's not allowed to come anywhere near, you know, within that 25 miles. He's not allowed to come anywhere near me. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, very moving. I did read your book last year, but uh, just the testimony is just amazing. Martin, you've talked a lot about forgiveness tonight. Um, and it says in the Bible, do not murder. So how then can God forgive these two guys if they were to ask God to forgive them? How can God forgive them if it says, do not murder? Yeah, well, that's a good question. There's, there's lots of um, things that the Bible says are, are wrong um, in, in life. And, and yet what we're told is that Jesus did indeed pay for ev every single sin, no matter what it was, as grotesque as, as, as all sin really is, that Jesus paid for all. And, and I think that the point of Christmas is that Jesus comes as this new human being to represent a whole new humanity and and the bible says that we in the book of romans chapter five it says that all of us have kind of descended from the first human being adam and we've inherited his consequences of condemnation and and sin in our own hearts but actually jesus comes as this new human being so that if we trust in him we inherit all the good consequences of what he did his righteousness his clean record and so the bible is just very clear that you're either in one of the two kind of figures and and Jesus is the one who's paid for absolutely everything no matter what it is so if we trust in him we will be completely forgiven and that that every sin has been paid for and you know you know that's that's what God is offering us in in Jesus which is, is staggering really when you think about all the sins and the sins we've heard tonight um that God is that gracious and and kind that he will forgive anyone who comes to him through Jesus Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Maureen. Back to David. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maureen, for uh, sharing with us and for it kind of being easy, but we do thank you for that and pointing us to the forgiveness that we can enjoy uh, from God himself through Jesus. And thank you, Martin, for uh, just speaking of that so clearly for us. Thank you, Roger, too, for interviewing Maureen, uh, her story. Thank you, Kez, for reading for us and Phyllis and asking the questions. And thank you to all of you for joining with us tonight. And well, our prayer is that you would know God's forgiveness through the Lord Jesus and know that whatever you've done, whatever we've done, that it can be forgiven and we can be right with God. And we, our prayer is that over this Christmas time that you would come to know the Christ of Christmas for yourself. Well, good to have you with us. Come back and join us uh, again with us next week. If you've missed any previous weeks, you'll find them all there on reallives.net. But that's all for tonight. And uh, good night to each one of you. And may God bless each one of you. Thank you. Good night. We heard celestial voices as we sat around the fire. We saw them in the starshine on the hill where we were. The mighty angel singing in a heavenly choir, singing glory, glory, glory to the coming Messiah. We went down to the city. They call it David's town With crowds of friends and strangers Milling around But no one else had noticed Nobody saw The glory in the heavens The good news from afar But we heard celestial Says, as we sat around the fire, we saw them in the starshine on the hill where we were. The mighty angels singing in a heavenly choir, singing glory, glory to the coming Messiah. Cared for by his mother, he was sleeping in the hay. We bowed our hearts to worship Israel's shepherd king. In humble adoration for all that he would bring. Salvation to the nations, joy in all the earth. Forgiveness to the sinner and to the lowly man his worth. Yeah, we heard celestial voices as we sang.